Welcome back or welcome to the IT Factory. My name is Yogi Roth. We are presented by Zayo and this set looks a little different today. Yes, we are in Tucson on the campus of the Arizona Wildcats in the Fox Family Digital Media Center. And today we had a chance to sit down with head coach Jed Fish. And the idea was let's get a state of the union. Like where is the program? And also get a tour of this brand new facility. You see this media center? This is where they're telling stories. And we know what we love on this show. And anybody who loves sport, we love the concept of story. We love the idea of taking the literal helmet off of the football player and diving into what makes them tick. And Jed Fish is responsible for all 105 plus players within this program and making sure they know what makes them tick. And I think heading into year two, it's been a complete flip. Literally on the roster, they're gonna have 45 new scholarship faces on this team when they get to training camp. And they got almost 20 new faces here for spring ball. So we wanted to hear about some of those players like Jane Delora or Tetaro McMillan or No Fafita and company, as well as him and what his journey and process has been like. So we began where, in our eyes, it all kind of began, which was the spring game a year ago when a guy named Gronk set a Guinness World Record by catching a ball from a helicopter. And as he would say, he's undefeated. He beat Teddy Grisky in that spring game. So we begin there and take you throughout this incredibly brand new, rebranded facility under the leadership of Jet Fish. I think you're gonna enjoy this one. The It Factor, the most overused and undefinable phrase in sports. If you have it, everyone knows it. Trent McDuffie applying a lever. The qualities that many desire, but very few possess. Dropped in the backfield by Thibodeau. Well, what really is it? Who has it? And how did they get it? Britton Covey gives Utah a jolt of momentum. That's what we're here to discover. We'll take the helmet off the Pac-12's elite performers to learn more about their journey towards success on Saturdays. I'm Yogi Roth, and welcome to the It Factor. You can call last year year zero if you wanted to. Like here we are year one, and I feel like everything has gotten a facelift, a change, starting with your facility. What was the impetus behind it? Yeah, well, we did kind of feel like it was a little bit of year zero last year as we were trying to just build it up. And we were, you know, we got here really in January 1st. By the time we get our staff together, it's the middle of January. And now you're getting started in spring ball during COVID, right? Um, and But one of the things that we noticed is we needed to facelift this building. We needed to, there really hasn't been much changes for eight or nine years. And we wanted to bring a whole new energy to the building. We wanted to change our messaging. We wanted to change how we were gonna do it. And uh, it started really come uh, May 1st. Yeah, well, it felt being here last year, like the spring game, like this wall that we're looking at. Can you read that quote that you put up there and share like what that moment, that image has done to kick off this rebranding of the program? Yeah, you know, we had this quote in the newspaper um, the day after the spring game. And I just said, it's pretty obvious what our program is going to become. It's going to be full of energy, enthusiasm, and joy. If you want to be a part of that, I suggest you come to the University of Arizona. <laughs> and uh, what better picture than the picture of Teddy and Gronk in our spring game? And, you know, this was right before we were entering uh, the field, you know, and I just love it because you see just true you know, emotion. You see emotion from Teddy and Gronk. You see emotion from Tyler Owens in the corner, um, our players' energy. And uh, I think it just started off at that point in time and we'll build it from there. Yeah, you know, what I love about this is there was about 150 alums here, those two included. And now here we are, state of the program per se, for the spring game and moving into the off season. And 250 plus yeah. alumni are here. How have you felt they've been welcomed into this building? What do they say as we walk through and check this place out? Well, I think we talk about, right, the biggest thing for us is bring one. I tell everybody on everything we talk about, give me a plus one the next time you come. So if you come to the spring game, bring a friend next year. If you come to, a, if you have season tickets, have your neighbor buy season tickets. If you came to the alumni weekend last year, bring another alumni this year. So I think we're at 280. Wow. Um, from 150. And uh, it sounded like we're at, you know, close to 10 or 15,000 people uh, for the spring game this year where we had about 7,000 last year. I love it. All right, so we are in like the ground floor of this facility. We walk in, this is where players come in. Where are we going? I see these chains over yeah. here. Like what, what is going on in this room, coach? So we kind of walk through from the main entrance and this is kind of, uh, you know, we just passed the training room, which our goal is to redo here within the next 12 months. And now we enter the cage. And our thought behind this was, you know, wildcats live in the cage. 
And when you're getting ready for the game and you're getting ready for, you know, entering the field, like where else would you rather gather? You know, and hopefully we can start getting to the point where you unleash and you run out um, of this cage. And uh, the night, as the game goes, we've got our Jumbotron. We've got all the lights go off. We have all sorts of lighting in here. Sound uh, system is pretty amazing. Music's playing. And, um, you know, we kind of just got the flooring done about a month ago. We've got all the graffiti on the wall. But the key is we want people to understand the messaging on the wall is still our messaging. Right, you'll still see things like the Wildcat way. You'll still see be a pro. You'll still see it's personal, even with you know kind of the graffiti ma messaging. Okay, so you're an offensive guy by trade, and you're a head coach now too. But like, when did you become like the marketing expert? Like, where, where did that part of your career begin? <laughs> well, well, I have good friends that are good at it. You know, <clears throat> really for me it was this. You know, we had a bunch of white cylinder. And I said, that doesn't tell me anything about Arizona. You could put white cylinder at any program in the country. You know, what's going to tell people we're a part of Arizona Wildcats? What's telling people that we're changing our way? What's telling people that the message is different? And um, we had a friend in uh, Houston. I had a very close personal friend that does this for a living. And um, he, he helped design every aspect of this building and uh, has done pretty good at it. Wow. All right. Well, let's keep it moving as we get through the cage. This is already like, I can't wait to get here for a game. I could just imagine the smoke, the noise, the players, the oh, swing, yeah. the whole nine yards. Yeah. You know, I think it, what's so neat about, you know, about the way we're setting this up and this is all going to be redone here in the next month or so. But, you know, our whole feeling is once you leave this cage and the doors open, you know, for the very first time, you know, we want our guys to look and feel for it to feel different. Now we're ripping up our field on May 5th. We're gonna have a brand new field put down. Um, so our players are gonna be coming in from a brand new cage to a brand new field. Um, and hopefully to what I hope would be a lot of success in the years to come. I love that. All right, where, where to next? No, I think we should walk into the weight room. The weight room was completely, it's where the project started actually. Um, that this was, is the first thing that you guys redid, right? When yeah, the here? first thing we redid was the weight room. Um, I, you know, I always, our AD will make the joke that I asked for new carpet and I ended up with a $10 million renovation. <laughs> and congrats to him, extension, right? <laughs> yes, That's no awesome. question. And, uh, you know, we, we, we started talking about Really, I mean, if you were to look at our walls, that's what it looked like, that white cylinder right there. And nothing changed. There was not one graphic anywhere in this building. Um, and, you know, even for us here on top of it, you know, we talk about have fun competing. We want them Damn. to see that when they walk in. We want them to feel that when they get here. Um, so it started here. This was an old green turf um, that was down here. Um, you know, to me, that's a great representation of having fun competing. So you're competing, but you're doing it with your own way, your own feel, your own energy. Um, we talked to our team about being a pro and the graphics on the wall. At one point, you know, up until we got here, were former players and the pictures kind of aged a little bit. And I don't know how much it was, let's say, taken care of. Um, and we wanted to get our message to our players. We want to be purposeful, resilient, original. So as we started building up our graphics, we felt like in the weight room is one of the main places you have to do that. So our messaging in our weight room was very clear. Uh, we ripped up the carpet, we ripped up the floor. There's not one piece of equipment that was here when we got here. So we were able to order and build every piece of equipment over the last 12 months. I remember the video that had since gone viral of when the players saw this yeah. for the first time. I know you love small wins. Like That had to be a small win. It was, for sure. And I, I think what we're trying to get done from here is not only is it about the new equipment, but it's the new mindset. And when they walked in here for the first time, they had to feel an investment in football, an investment in them. Um, we could see, we keep it a very signage is very clear in here of what we want to get accomplished um, but we didn't feel like we could just stop at the equipment we said how do you know i think we ordered 24 brand new televisions we ordered a brand new sound system it all lights up in red and blue on the poles we built a nutrition station we built an office for our nutritionist which we just hired full-time a couple months ago um, so our whole process was you know when tio got here i always joke with tio 
Gio, this is your first head strength job. You know, is there anything you need? No, I'm just excited to be there. Other than a couple million dollars for a brand new weight room. <laughs> <laughs> but th this has reverberations, right? For the players that are here, but also what's, what's the vibe when you're bringing in players? Like there's no mistake about it, you're one of the top classes in the league, one of the tops in the country. Yeah. We know what your record was last year, but how have you seen it impact recruits that maybe just see your record at first yeah. when they hear from you guys as a staff and then get here and see where they're gonna train and develop to be hopefully a pro one day? Yeah, well, I think what they, what they need to see and what they want to see is that they want to see a commitment to winning. And, you know, we don't want to necessarily harp on the past. You know, I go back and you do so much research and you look at so many programs that are building it and flipping it, and you look at that first year and, you know, no one's going to hold Bill Walsh accountable for the 2-14 and 14 or Tom Landry for 0-11-1. And, and I'm not by any means putting myself in those conversations, but when you're taking something brand new, you have to figure out a way, how do you flip the culture? How do you change the culture? And to me, it starts with walking in here and saying, this is all new and this season's gonna be a brand new season and we wanna be a part of lifting for the very first time on that bench. You're using that rack for the first time. We're using those dumbbells for the first time. And, you know, being in that pit stop uh, for the first time. And uh, like, that's why we think the messaging is so critical. Even in our nutrition office, you see be a pro all over the wallpaper because we want uh, our players to understand that it, you know, your body's your money maker in football and you have to make sure that you commit to being a pro eating just like you're committing to being a pro practicing. That's cool. All right, so we're next. So I, you know, I think we should head on upstairs. Um, I think we'll head up this way though. Okay. I think it'll right, be easier so to head up this way. As we walk upstairs, you, you just referenced year one. You've been around a lot of year ones, mm -hmm. probably more so than a lot of head coaches. What, what about year one do you look at and say, okay, this is going to equate to success in year two when you've been around a lot of teams in year two? Yeah, well, I think it's how you compete. You know, did we compete in every game? Did we fight in every game? Did we give the effort in every game? Can we build a foundation of competition? And the answer to that, I think, is yes. I think that our guys saw a team that wanted to play really hard and really well. Now, not on every snap did we do that. Did we play really well? Um, there was a lot of things that occurred throughout the process that I would say, you know, affected us one way or the other. But I think in the end, in year one, you got to set the foundation of competing. And you tell these, I tell these guys all the time, it's all up on our screens, is, you know, champions behave like champions before they become champions, right? That's Bill Walsh. And, you know, our goal is to behave like champions first and then start becoming them. So I love that we're walking up the steps here, like literally, yeah. but also figuratively. When you look at the climb that this program is, is on mm -hmm. right now, do you think it's, it's flipped, as you said? Like, what, well, what do you I, sense I'm now hopeful. the spring is concluded? I'm hopeful, you know, just like this trophy case. You know, we had no place to showcase any trophy that we've ever won here. Uh, they were in storage closets and they were, you know, they were nowhere to be found. And our feeling was, let's build something special. Let's build a trophy case where people recognize that you're walking to a championship mentality. So as we're building this and walking up the steps and taking the steps in our program, I think we're at the beginning stages. You know, I mean, I think we're starting the process, but we're getting there. So last year, eight games, one score games in the fourth quarter. What I took away was like every week, and we called a bunch of your games, your team didn't lay an egg per se. Right. And I felt like you had to have competed to give them a message, whether it was the Believe Ted Lasso t-shirts <laughs> one week. Like, oh, yeah. How did you come up with that? Because we're seeing all the creativity and we're about to see a lot more of it in this facility, but where did you go and dig in and find those things to keep this team connected to the message? Well, the players were able, made it easy because the players never deviated. They never stopped wanting to practice hard. There was never like a negotiation like, come on guys, I need you to step it up. I mean, they showed up to practice. They weren't late. They weren't messing around. They wanted to win, you know, and it was disappointing for us that we couldn't win more. Um, disappointing for our fans, of course, I'm sure. But, you know, when we're watching our guys play as hard as they played, we had, what, eight games were a one score game in the fourth quarter and we were competing and we were there, we were close. Um, they never quit. And yeah, we did some fun things. We researched and I called everybody I knew and asked different questions of like, 
what would you suggest or how would you do it or reading at nighttime trying to figure out ways. But in the end, I give all the credit to our kids. Yeah, that's impressive. So I love how your kids get influenced and also like how you're influencing them. This, this at one time was just the quote unquote players lounge. Yeah. Like, what, what do you call this room we're walking into? Yeah, so I mean, there's this pretty proud of this room here. Um, this is our fifth quarter room um, that is built off of or from the Deitzer Clarity Institute. And that's the, um, our, my friend that is in Houston that is really fantastic at what he does, which is leadership, which is uh, personal growth, which is helping our kids uh, not only maybe see different ways they can get better when football's over, what are they gonna do in life, how are they gonna succeed in life from resume building to practicing speaking at a podium, but also, you know, how will you become better, play, better leaders, better people, and um, be keenly aware of your own mentality. Yeah, so this morning, I sat in here with Noah Fafita and T-Mac, your two, pri two prized freshmen, right? Biggest recruit in the history of this program. And just watching them look around this room, they were like, what is going on? They're reading it, they're inspired. We're asking them a bunch of different questions, but it had an impact and they had no clue what this room even yeah. was. So what do you hope this does based on what you just said of, the Performance Institute and everything that mm -hmm. this room is reflecting. So Monday, we're going to unveil the curriculum. Curriculum. Uh, wow. There's a, there's a full on, uh, there's a full curriculum that's being built around this, that's built around this room. There's 150 activities currently in this room as we're standing here today. Damn. Um, and whether those come from understanding circuit breakers and what causes you to, uh, let's call it, make the decisions that you make. Uh, what causes you, we have, I love the boxing gloves, which is who is gonna tell you the truth? Mm. Who's gonna spar with you? Who can actually tell you what you don't wanna hear? Uh, so everything in here is meant to ask a question yes. to the athlete. Uh, we all know what a white picket fence looks like. To me, what does that mean to you? Is it inclusion or is it exclusion? Have you been incorporated into uh, oh. other people's lives. What type of team do we have? Do we have a team that we have half the team that live on one side of the fence, half the team that lives on the other? Damn. So there's so many different messages and so many different, let's call it stories. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the typewriter, right? You see a typewriter up there, you know, write your own story. What do we want our story to look like? You know, what do we want our, uh, you know, what do we want this to all be about? Uh, and there's so much more to it. I can't wait for our players to start investing in this room. Um, they can pick up a clipboard and, you know, something as simple as, uh, you know, answer some questions. Who is the sparring partner who challenges you in the most effective way? Identify one circuit breaker in a quadrant in terms of your relationships and just let them answer some questions and then put it away and then move on. But how do we help them? And um, we're going to build a whole curriculum around it. Damn. I mean, so... Everybody's listening to the It Factory, this is the show that, that, that we're hosting here. I think we need a new set, and I think I need to call your boy, <laughs> hook us up, so it could look something like this. Um, I, I want to go over to something that I think anyone will be able to relate to. Sure. Which, of course, is Dr. Seuss. Yeah. Right? Oh, the places you'll go. You've read these books with your daughters. Um, sure. I read them with my sons. And I think there's a childlike fascination that can get lost when you become a college athlete. You can lose your word joy. Yeah. Sometimes like where where do you net out now with this program and that word as we look at Dr. Seuss and a quote here in this room? Yeah. And I really think this room is like full of joy. Right. It's full of positivity. I mean, the arrow of positivity. Right. The the idea of just when you see the cartoon like figures on your wall, it, that's what it's about. Steve Kerr talked to our team the night before the San Diego State game a year ago. And he said one of our four values at Golden State is joy. Make sure you have joy in what you do. Yeah. And I watch our team currently, and I just see a team full of it, uh, full of joy and passion and a completely different feel uh, from where it was to where we're headed. And it's not even close to where I want it to go. But if we can just keep enjoying what we're doing, we got a great chance. You know, you sat down with me in 2019 on this very show, but you were working with the Rams mm -hmm. at the time. And you said a version of that quote then. But you're human, you're a coach, you won one game. Like, yeah. Did you find joy last year? How did you compete to find it? Did you have to recapture it after the season? Yeah, I had a hard time finding joy on Saturday nights, let's call it. 
from 11 p.m. till Sunday at 8 p.m. I mean, that was a tough, there wasn't a ton of joy there. Um, but there was joy in terms of knowing there's sometimes you, if you do the best you can do, right, there's joy in that. If you feel as if your kids gave everything they had, there's joy in that. Um, and really the, where I struggled finding joy is I felt for them so bad. Like they, they, I watched how hard they worked and it's such a physical game. And I can't relate to what we ask them to do in terms of how much we ask them to run and hit and practice. And, um, but I could just hope, you know, and I know hope is not a plan, but I can just hope that they are able to achieve success after they do that. And on Saturday nights, we didn't have the success we wanted. So um, that's what we're working through right now. But yeah, I mean, we had a lot of joy Monday through uh, the game. And we're going to try to have a little bit more joy at the end of them moving forward. All right, before we go to the next room, yeah. one last question for me around this. When I look around this room, like your brain is like, questions are being thrown at you. Like, how do you feel about unmasking clarity? Uh, do you want the truth, right? What is your story going to be? And when you are a coordinator, which you've been before, you always go to the head coach per se, and he can help you find the answer up. When you're the head coach, I always wonder like, who do you go to? So when you're pondering questions, where, where do you go now in this chair? Well. Um, luckily, I have a lot of great uh, people on our staff that have done it, that have been there, that have done, uh, have a ton of successes, um, that I sit there and talk with them. There are guys on our staff that have been around football their whole lives that I can talk with them. Um, there's also friends that I have outside of this profession. Um, and there's times that sometimes, unless they've been in that chair, you feel like maybe you need to ask those people those questions. And, um, whether it be Sean or Zach Taylor or Coach Belichick or any of these other people that I built strong relationships with over the years, I feel as if I could always pick up the phone and call them and say, have you gone through this? Are you going through this? And how did you handle it? And uh, they've been phenomenal throughout this process. Yeah, I, I love that vulnerability because I mean, you've been around head coaches. Sometimes like you're like, okay, well, who, who do I talk to? Yeah. I got to figure this thing out in my own big office. It's and I got nobody to talk sometimes. to. Yeah. All right, so, so what I love the most coming out of this, you're in this room, you're pondering life, the psychology is going, and then you walk out, and I didn't see this sign walking in, but it's the foundation of the program to a degree outside of competition, which is it's personal. You've talked about personal relationships, making it personal for yourself. We had Noah and T-Mac stand in front of this, and Noah said, it's personal to me because I want to get this program to a place where it competes nationally, not just in the league. And T-Mac sat where I'm standing, and he goes, I'm the biggest recruit in history, and it's personal because I'm gonna live up to it. Yeah. When you hear that, like, what's going through your head around a phrase that you brought to this program? I feel like we recruited the right people. You know, that's the first thing that would come to mind when you bring that up. Um, the second thing is, you know, we ask our players all the time, what does this personal mean to you? We say it, it's a lot of different places on our building, it's on your t-shirts, you know, whatever it might be, but what does it mean to you? And to everybody, it means something different because it's personal to them. You know, if you ask Chuck Cecil, what does it mean to be an Arizona Wildcat? This is his world, right? This is his world. Everything is personal to him when it comes to being a Wildcat. Um, you know, for me, it you know, means so many different things. It's personal to me when people question or doubt if we can do it or not, if we can win or not. Can you turn it around in Arizona? Do you, can you turn it around as a head coach? You know, all of the things that you deal with growing up and all of the, the questions that people have, you know, this is a way to answer them. Uh, and you gotta take it personal too. You know, you gotta, you gotta take every loss personal. I know people say it's not personal, it's personal. And uh, we make it very clear that we all believe that. And um, I feel like that's our best chance. Love that. All right, speaking of personal, um, these are some players. Is this like where your girls come and like they yeah, take they, these guys to task in video games or in pool every once in a while? Our kids will Pop a shot. We'll have a full on, uh, we, we got kids running around this building at all times, <laughs> you know, we don't. We, we certainly don't discriminate against families around here. So there's, uh, this room is all new, um, every piece of equipment, every piece of furniture. And you know what I'm most proud of as the head coach here is there, there's not a desk, there's not a chair, there's not a piece of carpet or a floor that was here 12 months ago um, in this entire building in three different floors. And uh, this, you know, every, from the pool table to the pillows to the papa shot, everything has just come in in the last six weeks. Uh, and we feel like you want to have a little bit of everything. You want to have the ability to play video games. You have laptops. You have printers. You have, you know, places to watch TV and, and just hang. 
That's cool. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about families. You bring in Jacob Cowing to the family, which includes his amazing son. I got to see running around Chase. the practice field. Yes. Um, what, what's that young man been like in terms of, okay, clearly he's talented, but he's also one of those older guys. I mean, he's got a lot at stake. He wants to change the trajectory of his family as we continue here in the, uh, in the hallway. We go down this way. Where do you think we should go next? Well, we can go either way. There's we got a timeline. We got a we educate. We can do anything. Yeah, let's do a we educate. Okay. But, but Jacob Cowing, like, yeah. What has so, he brought? Um, Jacob's brought everything you could ever ask for in a kid. Um, his skill set, fantastic, right? His energy, through the roof. His maturity, anything you could ever ask for. So to have Jacob here, I mean, you're talking about immediately bringing in a plug and play starter. Uh, you're talking about someone that had incredible success at the collegiate level already. Um, someone from the state of Arizona. It's personal to him in a lot of ways, right? Not only is he back here because of his son, but he is also back here because he was passed up. And there wasn't a school in Arizona that offered him a scholarship. And the fact that uh, he's now back here playing at Arizona, you know, close to his home, it's pretty awesome to have him here. He had a chance to talk to Hunter Eccles yesterday, and he referenced this right here. We educate, and Sean McVay coming in and talking to your team. And Zach Taylor, these two guys you obviously know and work with, yeah. both competed in the Super Bowl. The beginning of this idea became, began where? And then look at what it has become. Like When you look at all these faces and names, what runs through your mind? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. The very first person that spoke to our team was a Professor Robert Williams. Okay, and he talked about indigenous people's law. Okay, he's a law professor here, and we, want, we wanted to learn about why the Redskins were no longer allowed to be called the Redskins. Okay. So he brought, I, I said, you know what, let's bring a professor in and answer the question. And then from there, we brought in a couple of other professors, and then I said, you know, it would be pretty neat, bring in Matt Slater. Matthew Slater is everything and anything that a program should stand for, right? Uh, not only did he speak about social justice, right? He also talked about the importance of being a great teammate. And then from there, it kind of went into all sorts of different messaging. Um, at that time, it was such a strong social justice movement and discussions. I said, why don't we bring in a professor of the Holocaust to talk to our players about other things that have occurred in our past? Um, and then we brought in police officers. And, and then as this was going on, we said, you know, there's so many great, uh, former and current professional coaches that we have relationships with. Um, Steve Kerr and Pete Carroll. You know, we had Steve Kerr talk to our team and then Pete just interjected in the middle of, <laughs> That's great. Uh, in the middle of a Zoom. We had um, Howie Roseman talk to our team, the general manager of the Eagles, who's my former college roommate. Uh, and as we're, Jim Caldwell then spoke. And then from there, COVID was a huge topic. So why not ask a former NFL player to speak to our team, who is a neurosurgeon who ran the COVID-19 um, really situation at Harvard, uh, who spoke to our team at the Patriots Jeez. as well. And, you know, then we brought in different people throughout this time. Uh, and then, you know, from Jay Glazer to Brian Billick to Steve Spurrier, and we've got more and more coming. And then most recently, I would say last week, we brought in a professor um, from the Department of Languages of the Soviet Union. And we wanted our players wow. to learn about the Russia-Ukraine war. So we had about a 20 minute to 25 minute um, presentation from her about what's actually happening. So what is the there. chatter like afterwards? Like that's the magic I feel like after they hear that among players, what, what are you eavesdropping on or what are they talking about? You know, it really depends who the speaker is, right? You know, we had, uh, her, her topic was just, you know, I think there was some fear. I think some of our players, you know, she, as she said, she was, this is someone that one of our players said, how does this end? And her answer was not well. Yeah. And I think that kind of hit some kids at home, you know, like, wow, this is a real deal that we're sitting in. You know, Barry Sheck from the Innocence Project spoke to our team. And there was some amazing uh, feel from our players saying, wow, I can't believe, you know, how many people are on death row that shouldn't be or how many people he's helped exonerate. And there's that topic. And then you could turn around the very next day and 
the Surgeon General of the United States spoke to our team. And they're like, that's the most interesting man in the world. Richard Carmona, he was a Navy SEAL, he was a nurse, he was a police officer, head of the SWAT team, and the Surgeon General. So I think it's cool for our kids to just experience and see, and that's why we keep it up, so our recruits and our current team can be reminded of some of the messages they got. Yeah, well, we love seeing it. All right, let's see your office. Okay. Because I know this thing has been redone. Yeah. Well, before we go, actually, I mean, this is the fish tank. Like, tell, tell I had us to pay about for that, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, you Dave. can't just ask all the donors for money. You gotta actually you gotta sometimes it step it up yourself That's too. That's awesome. But um, yeah, this one is this one's near and dear to my heart. This is where the copy machine is. Mm -hmm. This is where the mail is. This is where coffee is made, and this is where our student assistants that want to work for free can work. And that's where you. This were is where right. I started. Yeah. After 400 notes on Steve Spurrier's yes. car. So the whole idea of this room is um, your office is in the copier, buy them coffee. And it's because that's, if you really want to be a coach and you really want to do it the hard way, you can't be just given some corner office and said, let's go figure it out. And that's why we call this the fish tank. Do you ever, I mean, you're obviously the guy now, but do, do you ever forget it? Like where it began for you? I try not to. I try not to. I, I think, you know, you get to see where you're at now, but what people, you know, don't see is the seven years of not being a position coach, the, you know, being a graduate assistant, then a quality control assistant, then an assistant position coach, you know, from 1999 all the way up to 06. So it, you know, from moving, you know, 12 different times to get to here. So I try not to forget that, and, uh, but also I feel like this kind of is a room where it says it's not about where you start, you know, but we talk about never letting up and never stop. One of the greats. There he is. Hello, Hello Chuck. Hello, Hello, Coach Cecil. Hello, Coach Fish. How, How are you, you doing? Doing, brother? <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah, I love this, man. Um, it, hits, it hits home on a lot of levels because there is a world where like so many coaches are skyrocketing yeah. to success that are young, but you have to have a foundation. And I think back to you working in trailers with the Houston Texans, you didn't even have a chair. You were just in a trailer, up, you know, hanging out with Dom Capers and Chris Palmer, right? Yeah. Those are the two guys. And you at what, 25 years old, 26 years old? Yeah, 25 years old, you know, and, uh, or, or, I mean, I, I'll remember the very first time they made an office for me at Florida after being there for two years that I was, I was just working on the GA's couch with a laptop on my chair, on my lap. Um, Hot or, thighs. And then they finally just threw a, in the, a storage closet where they just moved some videotapes around so they could put a desk in there. So, uh, you know, I think that's really what it comes down to. So good. I like it. Great name too. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great, man. Jonah, hello, oh, sir. So this is what's important to me here. Um, this is something that I did from my time in New England that, um, you know, these were, I didn't want white walls. You know, I, I just thought it was very hospitalized. Yeah. So uh, what we did in New England was, you know, you fill your wall or coaches' hallways with pictures um, from the games, from the wins. Um, so the players will come back and see if they're made the wall and in turn be across from their coach's office. You can't help yourself but go in and talk to your coach. Yeah, that's cool. So and that will change after every, every week. Yes. So, um, and you know, obviously at the end of the season, we, we, you know, put highlight pictures from the season, but our hope is each week to be able to update these walls and um, fill them in with new pictures. I feel like that's gonna be on a lot of players' Instagrams, like <laughs> selfie mode with their, their image from the game. No question. That's great. All right, so your office, like how did you, Try to design it. What did you want to design it into? As we see, these are all, you got all the signees on here. This is cool. Yeah. You know, one of the things that we talk about in terms of wins um, is what did we win at, you know? And I felt like our staff did a tremendous job in winning and recruiting. And um, so at that point in time, we decided to, to put these up. And, you know, this is, a, you know, this was a big win for our program. Uh, we had the top GPA three semesters in a row that football's ever had here at Arizona. Uh, spring, summer, and fall. So that's a win. We had the most amount of community service hours they've ever had all time for football in, this, in our first year of 1,136 hours. So Dude, how do you balance all this? So you, you, brand new facility, facelift, recruiting, kids going to class, well, color plays. 
which I, we have a great coaching staff. Yeah. We have a great bunch of his, uh, support staff. We have unbelievable, you know, athletic director who helps us get to be able to achieve what we're trying to achieve. And, and that's where I'm most fortunate. All right, so these are clearly some of your mentors. These are all of my mentors. This um, is like the who, if you could write down, these are the mentors I want in my coaching career. I mean, you can't really get much better than this, man. Yeah, well, you know, what I felt was this, that I'm only here because of them. And as I was thinking through, how did I want the entrance into my office to be? I wanted it to be about others. And I wanted, uh, when a recruit or a player walked in here, they understood that when we told them our goal was to be a pro and that we were gonna help them get to their dreams, that it's real, it's not just talk. And um, I felt like as we were, initially we said, well, why don't we just put the pictures up of those coaches or the staffs that I was on? And I said, why don't we do something different? Why don't we find a quote that we believe is the most reflective of the person, the program, that they are and what we're trying to accomplish. And um, that's how we ended up with this mural. So let's talk about Belichick. You spent time with the Patriots, right? Prior to getting this job. I mean, you did your press conference from Foxborough, yeah. right? Like <laughs> introductory via Zoom. Uh, and his quote is, talent sets the floor, character sets the ceiling. How do you judge and evaluate character, whether it's coaches or players you're bringing in? Well, I think it's time spent. Uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges you have or had in the, when you weren't allowed on the road recruiting made it much harder. Now that you're back on the road, um, you know, you really want to spend time getting to know the person, getting to know their parents, getting to know the family they came from, the principals, the teachers, you know, where are these kids coming from and what type of kids do you have? Um, because I, that, that's really where we're going to, that's where you differentiate yourself from, you know, culture and character. And, uh, you know, I think great character builds great culture. Uh, so that's kind of, you could see even from Bill to Sean, we compete with our schemes, but we win with our people. You know, the, the messaging is very similar. You know, it's going to be about the people first. It's going to be about the team. And then the rest of it will be what it is. All right, so let's talk about Jaden DeLora. Mm -hmm. How do you evaluate his character? Because we all know the dynamic quarterback that he is. Yeah, well, with Jaden, you know, we first off, right, right, right away, Right away, we took on a mentality with Jaden that we said, you know, he's available. We got to get in the game. Yeah. Like, he's too good talent-wise to not immediately get in the game, right? So first day, first moment he went in the portal, you know, I'm calling him, Nansen's calling him, Jimmy's calling him. Anybody that may have been able to get through to him got through to him. And um, I spoke with him, and I just loved his demeanor and the way he talked and the way he smiled on FaceTime. You know, and I remember Coach Burrier, I mean, 1999, he said, say yes, sir, no, sir, and smile a lot. It'll go a long way. And, you know, when you're, I was talking to Jaden, I'm like, man, this kid is just so much fun to talk to. And then he called me back the next day and he's like, coach, I'm out at the beach. So my service, I'm like, don't worry about me when you're out at the beach, man. Just call me when you get back. And it was just a good kid to talk to. And then we put him on a plane uh, when we could official him. And he and his mom and his dad flew out here. And we spent whatever amount of hours in here watching tape, talking, going through touring campus. And then he came over to my home. And I walked him in the backyard and we're talking. And I just said, hey, man, I'd love for you to be here. And he said, coach, I'm coming. And it was like the most awesome just... The fact that he was just so committed to wanting to come to us and, and cancel his other visits was pretty awesome. Wow. I got the chills just imagining that moment. Yeah, it was awesome. Okay, so how did you figure out this room and like where in the totem pole was the office in the incomplete rebuild? It was high. It was high in the totem pole because just like anything, I think it's super important that every, every recruit comes into the head coach's office. Every player should want to come into the head coach's office. We are very open with our team. Um, you know, quarterbacks will come in here and meet with me and whatever it might. So I felt it was very important that we redid this office and made this office one in which was both usable for 
being the offensive coordinator per se in terms of film study and meeting with our coaches, um, to be able to meet with quarterbacks, to be able to get my own work done, as well as walk into the other room and, and close some of these deals out and make sure that our recruits understand that from our president to our athletic director to our program, there's a commitment to winning and there's a commitment to, to having uh, a showpiece, let's call it. I love it, Ari. So we got the office where you kind of grind your tape, and then we have this amazing room. This is... I mean, we got, a, we got the office with oh, I the family. Look at those pictures. These are nice. We got, you know, because it's, it's very important for me that our, you know, that, that even if I'm not home very often, I can at least slide my chair over <laughs> and see, see the girls. You, you know, know it was amazing? So I asked T-Mac about his commitment to you and this program, and he goes, I called Coach Fish. And he was on the beach. And Neil goes, Noah said, he's always on the beach. Coach is always <laughs> on, on vacation at the beach. And I love seeing a photo of you and your wife, of course, in the sand. Yeah. Well, if I'm on vacation, I'm Yeah, of beach. course, of course, yes. <sighs> so how has your family been in right. the whole process here? Like, it's personal. All of, you know, I, I saw your wife in the facility. We see your kids at the facility at games. Uh, your wife came on with Ashley Adamson after the win last year against yeah. Cal and the Pac-12 Networks. Uh, what what have they gone through in this transition and coming to Tucson? Well, they, I mean, they love it. They're here all the time. I, I I heard a big applause today for a recruit, and it was my wife walked out of the elevator, <laughs> you know, with the recruit. But, uh, it, you know, she loves it. She's up here all the time. My girls are up here all the time. They love being in Tucson. Um, they're super active in the community. They're super active in athletics and recreation and all that other good stuff. And um, But it's been great. You know, Amber has... She's really embraced me here in Tucson, and it's so nice. It's 15, 20 minutes from the house to the office, and you get to, you know, in the college atmosphere, you, you get them around all the time. Beautiful. All right, so this is where recruits come. Is this like the end of the visit? You come on a meeting in here, and this is where you hope to? Yeah, I think it depends. Sometimes it's the start. Sometimes it's the end. Sometimes it's the start and the end. Yeah. Uh, whatever, it, whatever that player uh, needs, wants, or, you know, where he fits in the best. It gives us a chance to sit down with a big group, you know, we're able to talk through um, experiences. I think it's important, you know, that these kids get to see, you know, we don't just talk about, oh, we can get you in the NFL. We talk about, we've been in the NFL. Yeah. You know, we've been in New England. We've been in LA. We've been in Denver. We've been in Houston. You know, we've coached Cam Newton and Matt Hasselback and, sometimes I think is reflective when you can actually talk it and show it. And we kind of set this room up for that reason. Yeah. That has, uh... And candy. Candy sells, man. <laughs> Players come to my office <laughs> all the time because of candy. Oh, and, your, your kids must love this you too. You know, I get Dorian Singer and I get, you know, you got to get, the gummies are always the toughest to get, get through. You got to use the jelly beans. They go oh, there we quick. go. All right. Um, I got one. But, you know, like uh, some of our players, Dorian Singer is a prime example. I mean, he's coming in. That kid eats more candy and doesn't gain a pound. It's the most amazing thing. But at least I get him in my office. So then he has to ask me a question about football when he's loading up on Skittles, you know. I love that. Th these, real fast, before we get to the, the last spot on this tour. This photo. Uh, tell me about this with Florida. This is you with... The Ravens, right? Yeah. And that's when, like, David Shaw's there at a yeah. time. Rick Neuheisel's there. Was there. there. Yeah. Here with Josh Rosen. I can remember when you were there as an interim head coach. That was that stint to lead. Yeah. What does this wall kind of do for you here? Pete. Yeah, that's there. amazing. Who's that? Pete Carroll and myself when we were there. Was Steve McNair when I was coaching wow. the quarterbacks of the Ravens. Um, you know, I, I think pictures, you know, say, you know, speak a thousand words, right? And, you know, the ability, they always say, you know, I see better than I hear. And, you know, when you could help talk to a player or help talk to a parent about your experiences or what you've done or who you've been with or who you've coached, you know, it's one thing to say, I know them or I've been around them. It's another thing to, you know, you can talk through it, right? And Steve McNair is one of the best quarterbacks that's ever played. And, you know, standing before a game, talking to Pete while Pete's playing catch and, you know, <laughs> just... Even I've coached with them, and now we're coaching on two different teams. You know, I think that's what makes that picture so special to me. You know, I'm sitting in a Ram sweatshirt. He's wearing his Seahawks sweatshirt and still just sharing a great story and trying to recruit his son to come be our offensive coordinator. <laughs> you nailed it. So, and then, of course, you know, there's great memories of times at Florida. This is when I went back on a bye week when I was the offensive coordinator in Jacksonville and Noah Brindice, who we were GAs together. Wow. He gave me my first shot. He's just back there living in Gainesville. 
and uh, just connecting up with him. So it just reminds me and wants to up some great times together. It's amazing. Stories, you know, are such a big part of sport. And I, I know just with what we've seen on this tour, the story is, the narrative is changing, right? It's got some life to it. It's no longer black and white. It's got some color. But you were very intentional of having like a room where other people can share stories. Like we're literally, I work for the Pac-12 Networks. We have a studio. You got a studio here. I'm thinking about coming a little, <laughs> a little more often down here, maybe do a show out of Tucson. We'd love to have you, Yogi. <laughs> uh, you but know. where did this idea come from? Like this is when you walk in as a visitor, as a recruit, you drop in and you see this world-class production studio, man. Yeah, well, you know, NIL changes the game. And when you start thinking about personal branding and branding your program and being able to offer opportunities to your kids, to being able to showcase uh, some of the best parts of our program, um, I said, why not? Why was this a copy room? This was a copy room. Yeah. There was, this uh, is a copy room? Yeah, this was where Come we had all of our storage. This is a storage closet, a copy room. There was an office over here. And it was... I mean, I don't want to use it as dead space, but it was space that needed to be better. And uh, we came up with this, why not be the, you know, I don't know, first, second, third, 10th, doesn't matter, team that's going to build a TV studio right in-house, be able to have our own sideline reporter, our own in-house reporter, our own digital media team. And um, we said, we're going to make this room special. And then hopefully we get to a point where our kids can use it more and we could run our own podcast out of here and... Uh, cat center totally so it's a pretty cool deal wow island time in the desert right like that's yeah. that's the show team akanoa um so this show is called the it factory and before we let you go at the end of this episode um I always ask the same two questions okay so the it factor i feel is like the most overused and undefinable phrase in sport uh, you can you can't often say what do you think this team's it factor is as we kind of take stock of where you are after spring ball heading into year two as head coach? Yeah, uh, well, that's a tough question, you know. What is our it factor? Um, I think competitiveness. I think I could see, you know, I could see that there's a confidence among our team that wouldn't necessarily correlate to record in the past couple of years and there's a confidence because of the fact that we have a lot of players that weren't on part of that record and a lot of players that don't want to be a part of it again so i, I kind of just sense i would say confidence is coming from the competitiveness of our squad yeah it, it feels so grounded just being out at practice being here for the spring game again from a year ago or calling games you know, it, it's a different roster. You're going to have 45 new scholarship faces okay. by the time you kick off the season out of 85. And just talking to some young players today, they were like, this does not feel like a team that only won one game. Like, does, and T-Max said, he goes, I've never been in college. So I don't know what it's supposed to feel like, but it doesn't feel like a team that is going to lose. Right. Do you sense that as well as the coach who's been around it from jump? Oh. I mean, I always say I want to wear a t-shirt that says they're only freshmen. But, uh, you know, right now I think the expectations are, there's so much energy around our program right now, which is fantastic, right? But uh, what's going to be exciting for our kids is when they have to start competing, because we're going to compete against really good teams every week this season. I mean, we open up with San Diego State, Mississippi State, North Dakota State, right? Those are our three non-conference games. And then we have nine in the Pac-12. So we know there's going to be an enormous battle ahead of us. We know this is a process just getting started. Um, Love the energy of our team, yeah. Do I love the blind confidence of our team? Yes. You know, I think that's fantastic. Um, now I just believe it's going to come down to how hard are we going to work the next three months on your own in the weight room, uh, you know, when your coaches aren't watching. How good can you become then in phase three? And then when phase four hits, which is training camp, you know, how good of a team can we become in those 28 days? All right, last one, Coach. Um, you've been a head coach for over a year now. Right. This, as we talked to jump, right, year zero kind of was last year. This is your proverbial year one with all the recruits that you've brought in, how you've molded your identity on this team. As a head coach, what is it that you know for sure right now? Well, the one thing I know for sure is that I could be a lot better than I was last year. You know, that it's about growth. It's about finding ways to um, be better calling plays, be better with balance in life. Be better with your team. 
uh, and just each year keep finding ways to get better. Um, I'm also very confident in our staff. I feel as after one year that I feel great about our coaching staff right now. I feel great about our coaching staff additions right now. Uh, bringing in Johnny Nansen and Jason Kafusi and Brett Arce and Mike Switzer are a huge gets for our program. Uh, that excites me beyond belief. Bringing in Ben Hilgard, who was the head strength coach at Virginia Tech for six years, now is our number two guy here with T.O. Huge for our program. So continuing to get better, you know, is, the, is every part of this growth mindset. And uh, we're going to do everything we can to um, sometimes be a little uncomfortable to become good. Yeah. All right, if you could, in a word, how would you finish the sentence? It all comes down to, in 2022, for your program, what is it? It all comes down to growth. Can we get better? Can we get better? And if we can, we'll have a great shot. I love it. Coach, thanks for joining the It Factory. The first time we've ever done one where it's like a walking tour, uh, it was a blast. Of course, presented by Zayo. Thanks for the time, man. Thank you. Appreciate it, buddy. I love it. There's Jed Fish. That's awesome. <laughs>